enabling this tapered assets, these new stable coins at the edges of the network and keeping the Bitcoin core, Bitcoin only, that really turns Bitcoin into like a global routing currency. You know, you could go dollars to yen or euro to GPB if you wanted to. Bitcoin is the other side of all of those trades, which I think is really, really important. You are exchanging currency to currency and the medium through which that exchange happens is Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. Ryan, it's been too long. Uh, it's been a bear market. You've been building, and uh, welcome back to the show. Super excited to be here. Um, really, thanks for for having me on. Yes, you know, while uh, I would I would caveat and say, you know, the very smart engineers on my team have been building. Um, you know, I helped, uh, but you know, they've been building, and yeah, we're really excited to chat about um, you know our the new developments. You know, tapered assets, our big mainnet launch. Um, and in general, just an update on Lightning and Bitcoin. So here's the thing that the audience needs to know about Ryan. He's also an engineer, even though he does more of the talking about the engineering, because unlike most engineers, he's great at explaining complex uh, ideas. So that's why you're here and we are thrilled to have you. Um, Thank you. So we're talking about the Taproot Asset Protocol. You guys have been working on this for how long? Because it's been a few years that I, I initially heard about the launch, but now it's official. It's out. How long have you guys been working on this? Yeah. So the first public announcement where we dropped, you know, um, the specification, the Bitcoin improvement proposals that describe, you know, again, this is really important that this is an open source protocol. That was at Bitcoin 2022. So you know, sometime late April or early May um, of last year, we did our first kind of alpha drop of the code, um, you know, which was very much pre-product, um, I believe in September of last year. And so that was kind of version 0.1. We had version 0.2 sometime in between, you know, maybe six months or so ago. And then this past um, Wednesday is when we did the version 0.3 launch, which is the first one that is, you know, mainnet ready. So this is, you know, gives developers the tools to issue, send, receive, and explore assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, super excited to have it out. Super excited to give them developer hands. Like I can just tell you, you know, internal metrics already of what we've seen, the uptake we've seen over the last 24 hours has been like really impressive um, traction on social media. People are really excited about this. Um, so, you know, the team has been hard at work. We're getting to see, you know, a little bit of early payoff, um, which is awesome and super validating. Um, but the you know, the, the ultimate goal of lightning integration, um, of, you know, stable coins and financial assets that are integrated with the lightning network. Um, you know, that's still yet to come. So this is like a really important milestone. We've got the on-chain portion shipped, ready, ready for mainnet. Um, and now we're, you know, back to heads down, getting the lightning integration built out. Help people understand where this is at in Bitcoin. So is this layer one, layer mm -hmm. two on lightning? Where, where's the code kind of manifesting itself? Yeah, it's it's interesting because it doesn't really fit into the usual, you know, layered paradigm. What I will say is that um, from a high level perspective, what we're doing here is, you know, Bitcoin individual, the, the smallest unit of a Bitcoin in the database is a UTXO, right? An unspent transaction output. So I like to think of these as like the equivalent of a gold bar. You know, UTXOs can be of different sizes, different denominations. You can have a UTXO that's 100 Bitcoin, 1,000 Bitcoin, you can have one that's as small as, you know, a couple hundred Satoshis, right? Um, but they are all, you know, objects as these UTXOs, which, I, you know, you can think of as a gold bar. So what we do with Taproot Assets is uh, when you mint some new assets on the Bitcoin blockchain, what you do is you take one of those UTXOs and you fill it up with a bunch of new assets. So you have a Bitcoin, a UTXO that was, say, worth one Bitcoin. You make a transaction and all of a sudden you have a UTXO that's one Bitcoin and also has, you know, a hundred dollars of a stable coin in it. Right. So like from a, from a code perspective, what we're doing is we are committing to a bunch of off chain metadata that says, you know, this is issued by, you know, Preston. Um, it is, there are a hundred units, um, and it has, you know, this ticker, um, et cetera. Right. And we are committing that information to a UTXO. So on chain, this is as scalable as of a protocol as you can possibly get. Right. It's very much like Lightning, where all the actual activity happens off chain. 
Um, and there's just a really, really small footprint of data on chain. So, you know, effectively what this could do is, you know, you could mint a million units of a stable coin and pay, you know, a couple cents. Um, you could transact millions of units at a time and only pay, you know, a single on-chain fee. Um, so it's, it's an off-chain protocol, um, that, you know, we, we think is as incentive compatible with Bitcoin as you can get very similar to lightning, um, yeah, but it is not, I wouldn't say a layer two because we are actually transacting assets that aren't Bitcoin, right? They are net new assets, um, that are, you know, predominantly in the early days, we expect, you know, tied to off chain assets, like, you know, how stable coins, um, are referencing, you know, uh, uh, reserves held by some corporate entity, right? Um, these are similar in that they're, they're, they're off chain assets that have been realized on chain for the global liquidity and some settlement of lightning, et cetera. So let's just uh, take the example of, of a dollar stable coin. So mm -hmm. you're you're coming up with this uh, Taproot asset protocol. You're saying that there's a hundred a hundred tokens of mm -hmm. U.S. dollars, and um, they are not on Bitcoin. But what you do is you inscribe almost like you're throwing an anchor into layer one Bitcoin, and you're inscribing that this ledger of these hundred U.S. dollar tokens exist in this new taproot asset protocol mm -hmm. and you're throwing that anchor into layer one bitcoin to say that that this is the proof this is the inscription proof that this was created at this date and time or in this block yeah um, i would say that like the word inscribe now because of the ordinal stuff like that has a little yep. bit of different connotation where ordinals okay. with inscriptions they're actually writing into the block space itself right we are doing something much lighter weight we're more it's basically just a timestamp right, is, is a, you know, timestamp that's verifiable and provable that says these were issued at this time by this key um, and with this information. And everybody who follows the protocol who's running the software can notice that, recognize it, and agree upon it. Got it. So it's it's a lightweight anchor mm -hmm. that through encryption, that's what makes it lightweight. Yep. Because when we talk about inscriptions, I think it's important that like you could take all the data from a JPEG and uh inscribe that into layer one bitcoin through inscriptions and um point some type of uh reader or browser to that data on the blockchain and and you can come you can uh repopulate that image with a web browser by looking at this is more of we would take that jpeg we would compress it uh through encryption down to just a hash effectively mm -hmm. And then we're populating that hash. And if you have the key to know what that, what, what compressed it, then you can open up the file and know what it says inside. Is Am I describing that correctly, uh, Ron? Yeah. I'm, just, I'm, I'm yeah, trying to understand it. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It, it, it's a lot to wrap your mind around, but effectively, like, you know, and it's important to note for the audience that, um, you know, all of this is going to be abstracted away from the users, right? What you're going to see is you're going to have a wallet that says, oh, do you want to generate an address to receive some USD, whatever, um, on Bitcoin? And you'll generate an address. It'll look a little bit different from a Lightning address and a little bit different from a Lightning invoice if you're receiving on chain. But then the person who's sending to you will get the address. They'll press send just like a normal Bitcoin transaction, and it'll just work, right? Um, and it'll behave kind of exactly the same. Um, but your wallet, what it's doing, there's a bunch of this complicated cryptography in the background to verify like, okay, this asset that's being sent to me is one issued by the issuer that I'm expecting, right? It's not a counterfeit. Uh, I can prove cryptographically that it is issued by the person I'm expecting. Two, I can prove that I'm only receiving, you know, the amount of units um, that I want, or I can verify that I'm only receiving the amount of units that I want. Um, and, you know, three, I'm, I'm verifying, you know, each step in this asset's history back to the actual issuance, right? Making sure that you know, every, every step along the way, um, it was not double spent just like we do with Bitcoin. Right. Um, but it's, it's, that's one of the really cool things, but the protocol is we inherit, although, you know, a lot of this nature of the assets themselves are off chain for scalability reasons. Um, we inherit all the same double spending protection of Bitcoin. We inherit a lot of the integrity, um, and the security of the protocol by, you know, like you're saying, anchoring into the Bitcoin chain and, and committing this data, um, uh, into the chain itself. So for years, having been in this space and for years, I've heard from Ethereum folks, Tron, uh, 
the people at Stacks, every one of them are saying, or at least they have to date, said that something like this is impossible to do on Bitcoin, and mm -hmm. you have to have a proof of stake system and not a proof of work system to do this. Mm -hmm. And it appears that like that is not true, and that you guys have kind of cracked the uh, the software to mm -hmm. enable this. Is is that a fair statement, or do you think that there's still some nuance to what I just said? So I would actually say that the nuance is not necessarily that we cracked anything because this is, you know, there's a long lineage of people trying to build these protocols on the Bitcoin network. Um, you know, and we, we reference and credit a lot of prior art in the Bitcoin approval proposals, right? Like I know Peter Todd has done a bunch of work here, um, in particular. Um, so there's a, this is, there's a lot of old ideas of trying to build asset layers on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. I think Taproot in particular, and then just the timing of the demand of stable coins made it to where we could build a really nice, slim, scalable protocol um, that natively integrated with, with the Lightning Network to serve a use case that we just know that there's tons of demand for, right? So uh, like on the kind of other chains perspective, you know, that's a little bit of their talking their own book, um, which is fine. That's part of the game. Um, but you know, stablecoin started on Bitcoin, right? Um, they, they began on the Omni protocol, you know, years ago, uh, a decade ago. Um, and it was just that they weren't, the protocol was on chain only and, you know, didn't scale, um, and, uh, you know, wasn't able to leverage the lightning network, um, at all. Uh, and then, you know, just general developer friendliness was not really a huge priority in those super early days. So we've kind of taken a more um, updated view with updated technology of old ideas um, and made them new again. And so, you know, I think that we're really excited having seen, I think the greatest hope for this protocol is that we've seen a lot of developers and a lot of users, you know, expand beyond Bitcoin to other chains to try and, you know, experiment with these new use cases. And we're kind of bringing these use cases that we have admittedly seen succeed elsewhere back to Bitcoin, right? Back to the mothership, back to the secure, decentralized infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we hope that in this next bull cycle, we will bring a lot of those users and developers back and we'll retain a lot of the new users that show up because we have kind of improved the value prop, so to speak, of the Bitcoin ecosystem. You had mentioned uh, haven't levered the, the Lightning Network. Is... Mm -hmm the Taproot Asset Protocol leveraging the Lightning Network as well as Layer 1? So that is the ultimate goal. Like there was, um, there's like a lot of prerequisites that had to be built first before that. And so the two major ones are, one, we needed to upgrade the Lightning Network generally to support Taproot channels. And so for context, for those that aren't familiar, um, you know, the Taproot soft work, um, I believe was, activated uh, in 2020, 2019 or 2020, one of those two, 2020, I think. Um, and, you know, that gave us, uh, no, sorry, 2020 or 2021. Um, and so that gives us, you know, a whole bunch of new capabilities for, you know, more private channels, um, you know, more cost-effective channels, et cetera, on the Lightning Network. So we had to build all the Taproot channels first. And then we also had to build all of the on-chain components of the Taproot Assets protocol first. So that you could mint, send, and receive on chain. But now, with these two prerequisites finished, live um, Taproot channels are you know live in LND, the Lightning Network daemon. Um, Lightning Labs is open uh, source software implementation of the Lightning Network um, as an LND seventeen, which we shipped a month ago. And now we have the Taproot asset daemon live on mainnet for on chain usage. The next step is combining these two together so that you can transfer Taproot assets over the Lightning Network, which is where we think you know particularly for stable coins, but, you know, for other uses, that's like the real value prop. That's the real killer use case that we're excited to enable. And it was important that, as you noted, none of the kind of previous asset issuance, asset management protocol attempts on Bitcoin were specifically designed to interoperate with the Lightning Network, right? And so that's one of those things where, you know, again, the, the demand here was um, in 2021, you know, after the El Salvador Bitcoin legal tender announcement, you know, Lightning, the Lightning community saw just tons and tons of explosion of usage in emerging markets in particular, right? I think through a lot of the 
the El Salvador use case and, you know, give credit to Jack Mahler for kind of spreading the word. Um, people really got the cross border remittance use case of lighting. That was one that really clicked for people. Right. And so, um, we started seeing, you know, Ibex Mercado in Central America, um, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet in and Goloi in El Salvador, of course, you know, Neutron Pay in Southeast Asia, Bitnob in West Africa, um, you know, Bipa down in Brazil. Like we have these lightning startups all over the world that all of a sudden, so there's a big surge of usage um, because people really got, oh, I can do this for minutes. It's, it's like sending a text message instead of going to stand in a, you know, kiosk for Western Union. Um, people really got it. But then as the year progressed and as, you know, this kind of growth uh, wave started to, you know, not really subside, but as, as it started to peak, uh, we kept hearing from all of these emerging markets developers and lightning entrepreneurs like, okay, I've, I've acquired all the Bitcoiners, right? Like I've, I've got them. Um, they're using my app. This is great. The next tier of user, um, the next group that I'm going after to try and onboard onto my business, like they want the dollar. Um, they love the experience of lightning. They love the global reach. They love the instant settlement. They love the low fees for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, Bitcoin is just as an asset is just a bridge too far for them. And what they really want is the dollar. Um, and so that kind of just a bunch of timing happened, uh, to line up there with the tech being ready, um, with the team being ready, with hearing all of this kind of user and customer demand where we're like, okay, well, we gotta, we gotta build a protocol to support that. And so that is the ultimate goal. And today we don't have tempered ass assets integrated with lightning yet. Um, but we expect that is priority number one and we expect to have that, you know, soon. So once that uh, combines or basically that rolls out that you can then leverage lightning for the settlement of these assets, I think you get into a really interesting scenario where, um, you know, uh, Peter McCormick was down, I think it was in Argentina, and mm -hmm. he was trying to get uh, dollar stable coins. And um, the conversation started off with, Hey, do you want me to uh, do this over Ethereum? And the guy laughed at him and says, "No, that's like five dollars uh, just to conduct that transaction. We we use Tron, which is one dollar, mm -hmm. and uh, for the transaction settlement. So on this, what would be the transaction settlement for a dollar? Would it be like what it is for Bitcoin, which is like a Satoshi or or two to to conduct that fee, that basically the fee for the settlement once you guys roll that out?" Yeah, I mean, the really cool thing about the Lightning Network, I think the coolest thing about the Lightning Network actually is that because of the integrity of the market mechanics that surround the fee setting, the permissionless ability to, you know, open channels and add liquidity and, you know, undercut people whose rates are publicly advertised to route payments, um, there is constant downward pressure on fees in the network. Right. And we see this, you can, and again, this is a fun thing to watch if you're a Lightning Network nerd um, like myself, but you can watch kind of the games that routing nodes play where like, so, so let's see, you wanted to receive to your specific node um, and you have five channels, five entities who are providing liquidity to you, right? All of their fees to route that final op to you are publicly gossiped, right? They're, they're, they're public information. So if you watch, you can see people kind of play games and undercut each other, right? And make sure that if one entity all of a sudden raises their fees out of equilibrium, guess what? They're just not going to route any payments, right? Um, the, the, the network integrity is such that payments will go to the lowest fee route um, and make sure that there is that downward market pressure. So, you know, I can't give a you know specific number because it depends on where in the network you're sending to, but I can tell you that it's very rare to see total payment costs, you know, in double digit bips, right. Um, of the amount being sent. So, you know, for retail size payments, you know, anything under a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars or something like that. I mean, you're looking at a, an a minuscule payment, right. And especially if you're sending something like $5, right. I mean, think about 10 bips of that, right. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, sub cent almost, um, right. It is sub cent. And so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at and what we're expecting. It depends on the amount, but the fact that there is downward market pressure and, you know, Ethereum, you're competing with large DeFi for transactions for block space, right? Um, I don't really know exactly how 
fees on Tron work, but I think it's just kind of up to Justin's own to set whatever he wants, right? <laughs> I, um, I think that's accurate. Yeah. And so there is not this free market of liquidity provisioning that keeps fees low. So I think over time, other platforms will not be able to compete. I, I think just the economics of the Lightning Network will went out to where the cheapest, the lowest cost and fastest way to transfer stable coins will be on Lightning. So as a person that's open channels with other nodes mm -hmm. and uh, you got large channels, you got small channels, you can zap, you know, sats through a node to somebody else. I'm curious about the fungibility of these sats and how mm -hmm. the data of these assets are somehow incorporated into these channels. Um, yeah, it's like, it's. This is a really cool part of the protocol, I think, actually. Um, it's it's pretty beautiful because in the initial stage, and this is more of just a kind of quirk of the protocol, um, initially, when we roll out tabard asset channels, um, they will be private only. So you won't announce to the world, my channel exists, right? So that means you won't be able to actually route through tabard asset channels. Um, instead, they will only be the initial hop, so the sending channel, and and or the final hop, the receiving channel, will be the you know stable coin liquidity. In between will be the existing Bitcoin in the network. So you will have you know the first hop node um, will effectively be if you're making a U.S. dollar to then route through Bitcoin to then U.S. dollar payment. The initial node will be effectively receiving dollars and paying out Bitcoin. And the way that they're doing that is using the existing hash time lock contract HTLC construction that all Lightning Network payments um, uh, leverage. Um, so you're doing a usual HTLC, um, that initial hop you know, is receiving dollars, paying out Bitcoin. Bitcoin routes through the network. Um, everybody gets paid in Satoshis along the way. And then that final hop receives Bitcoin and pays out US dollars, right? So it is a atomic, you know, payment where people on either ends are negotiating rates. Um, they are doing the swap, um, you know, an FX swap effectively. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the actual transaction in the middle of the routing nodes in the core of the network don't even need to upgrade. They just know that they're, they're routing Bitcoin payments. They might not even know that it's a tapered asset payment at all. Um, but at the edges, they may not know that they're using Bitcoin, right? They're just using dollars. Is this only available to people that are running the LND implementation on their node, or could this be no. any lightning? Good question. So our the goal, the reason why this is an open protocol, this is an open spec. We did a lot of work actually in making sure that anybody can write their own implementation in Rust and C or whatever language would be best for their implementation. We want this to be for everybody. Um, now we are only building the implementation that works with LND, um, but it is an open source protocol and we fully expect as, as it gains popularity that we will see additional implementations that work for the other implementations. Got Cause it. it's like, this is, this is not a, a lightning labs thing, right? This is a Bitcoin thing. Um, this is, this is for everybody because we want, we think this is really good for the network, um, for both networks, both the Bitcoin and for lightning. So let's say that you guys finalize this uh, coordination over Lightning and you roll out the, the next update uh, for a person running a node. Uh, for all these channels that I already have open with mm -hmm. other uh, nodes, is this something that I'm going to have to toggle to enable or is it just uh, ready to go? Do I have to update my node with uh, the new LND? Uh, software, walk us through like what that's like from the perspective of the node operator that is not technically dialed into uh, yeah, everything true. that's taking place here. No, for sure. So, you know, we are going to endeavor to make this as easy as possible. Um, and, you know, not just us, but, you know, if you're running on Umbral or Start9 or you have a Voltage node or kind of any one of the, you know, um, distributors that that make it easy to run a node, a lot of them actually with this next software update will be able, you'll be able to access the tapered assets daemon like out of the box, right? So that's our, our bundle of tools that we call LitD. So LitD um, version 0 0.12 has LND, 
Um, it also has TapD, and then it has our liquidity management tools, Loop and Pool, um, and then also has a couple other things. Um, so we have this one nice bundle that a lot of the, you know, um, again, Umbral, Start9, um, Voltage, BTC Pay Server, a lot of the like node in a box type operations provide that, uh, use that bundle instead of just pure LND. So you'll be able to update, you won't have to do anything, and all of a sudden you'll have these new APIs to let you mint, send, and receive assets. Now, in order to then open an actual channel with tapered assets with stable coins in it, um, you would need to either acquire the stable coins yourself first, just like how you have to acquire Bitcoin first and then open a channel with that Bitcoin um, in order to use it, or you would have to get somebody who has the tapered asset in question to open a new channel to you. Right. So it's not like you can necessarily update existing channels that you have to um, all of a sudden also have tapered assets in them. It would have to be a new channel, but that's just how I How about for generally. how about if I wasn't really even wanting the stable coin, but I wanted to enable the routing through my ah, great question. So that very importantly, you don't have to do a thing, right? You just have to keep running. You don't have to ever touch tapered assets if you don't want to. Right. All you know, all you know, like I said previously, is that your volume has increased because people are sending or routing more Bitcoin around it. So this is why, you know, in the um, uh, in the blog post and we've been like working on kind of the framing of this, we're talking about how, you know, enabling this tapered assets, these new stable coins at the edges of the network and keeping the Bitcoin core um, Bitcoin only. That really turns Bitcoin into like a global routing currency, right? It's where we're literally for these FX transactions, people going from, you know, you could go dollars to yen or euro to GPB if you wanted to, right? Bitcoin is the other side of all of those trades, which I think is really, really important. Um, and like that's a, it's a little bit of a different frame on making Bitcoin a medium of exchange than what people think, right? It's not necessarily medium of exchange in terms of using Bitcoin to buy coffee. It's no, you are exchanging currency to currency and the medium through which that exchange happens is Bitcoin and the Lightning Network, right? You are physically routing um, dollars through Satoshis, through Bitcoin, and those node operators in the core, to your point, don't have to have any idea that they're routing a tempered assets payment, right? To them, they're just doing their normal job of forwarding Bitcoin around. Um, and you are actually using Bitcoin as like a medium, like in the traditional sense, like air or water or something to route value. And we think that's like really, really important, you know, in terms of realizing the internet of value where, you know, the internet, what that means is it's a network of networks, right? Um, it's, it's a way to connect a bunch of disparate networks. And we see Lightning similarly, you know, evolving into something that is, you know, a payment network of networks where it is connecting, you know, a bunch of these other existing payment networks, existing fintech operations, you know, um, sovereign users, um, et cetera. But it is, you know, Bitcoin at the core, just like how at the core of the internet, it's just TCP over IP. In preparation for this discussion, Ryan was kind enough to send me uh, a couple articles that really kind of did an incredible job kind of walking a person through the technology and uh, just some of the more interesting points about this. And one of the one of the things that I really, really found a lot of value in there's there's a person that uh, the website is called coinshares.com. We're going to have a link to this particular article. It's very uh, very in depth. Uh, we're going to have a link to this in the show notes, but uh, about halfway down through the article, there's this figure 11 and it says the evolution of tether transfers on crypto platforms. Mm -hmm. What it does is it, it shows the percentage of, uh, tether in, and it's, uh, like what it's been minted on, which protocols it's been minted on. And it shows how, um, as Ethereum came online, how it took away from this Bitcoin USDT, uh, use. And then as Tron came on, how it took all of the, uh, the, basically the dollar stable coins away from Ethereum. And because we're talking about the fee incentive, it's just, it's the, it's the incentive of not having to pay a lot to transact. 
And when I'm looking at what you're describing- And it's also, it's also just to be quick, we're quick interjection, it's also the speed of settlement, right? That's a very, very important aspect, right? Bitcoin block times are 10 minutes. Um, I forget the exact number for Ethereum block times. It's like two minutes. Yeah. It much, was. <laughs> yeah, right. Who knows what it is now? Um, it's much faster. And then, you know, Tron is down the order of like, you know, five or six seconds. So the speed yeah. of settlement and low fees, that's what people want. Yes. Okay. So when we think about that and we think about what you just described with this now taking place over lightning, which is less than five seconds, it's immediate oh, practice. Milliseconds. Mm-hmm. Milliseconds. And the fee is so small that you don't even you don't even think there's a fee. Um, I just I, I'm looking at the incentive of people continuing to use the Tron uh, network, which which, by the way, like back to your comment, I don't know if people are intimately familiar with Tron, probably not if they're listening to this show. But uh, your comment about Justin Sun basically being able to determine what the fee is because it's a very centralized uh, protocol, like mm-hmm. all the others. And why we continue to talk about Bitcoin is because it's actually decentralized. Um, so I don't know. I I, I would like to think that a, a lot of this is going to come to this protocol because of those two key characteristics and incentives, which is basically no fees and immediate settlement. What, what am I missing? I uh, Prior to this year, um, I would have said that the thing that you're missing is that maybe Lightning isn't integrated all the places where the users already are, right? But this year we got Binance, right? We got Coinbase coming soon. Like all the places that the users are where they're sending um, USDT over Tron, they now have Lightning too. And, you know, the people who are using cryptocurrencies for like the utility of it, um, well, I guess even even the people using it for the speculative value, but you know the, use, the people who are using it as a tool, they're very smart and they're very pragmatic and they're very capable of figuring out, you know, how do I get the best deal, um, and and how do I use this new technology most efficiently? Um, and I think that now that we have Lightning distributed in all the places and connected in all the places where these users are, um, I think it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of getting the assets issued, and it's a matter of people realizing and spreading through word of mouth, like, oh man, like you're still paying a, a dollar uh, per transaction on Tron. Like I'm only paying five cents on lightning. Like, you know, you're, you're missing out, man. Um, you're, you're, you're on the old tech. I'm on the new stuff. Right. Um, Cause I think That's you're a- right. It's, it's purely just the incentives are better. The platform is better. And I think also another thing that you'll, you know, that is underappreciated is Bitcoin infrastructure, Bitcoin software. And I'm not, I'm, Absolutely talking about Lightning Labs' software, but not just specifically Lightning Labs' software. Bitcoin software is just at such a level above the rest of the industry in terms of security, in terms of integrity, in terms of, um, you know, how battle tested it is. Um, Also in terms of just, you know, how much attention is paid to developer friendliness generally. Um, We hear from entrepreneurs all over the world all the time who are Bitcoiners, Bitcoin operating Bitcoin companies. But have had to support Tether on these other platforms because it's just, you know, there's user demand for it. Um, and they're just continually just like, please, please let me spin down, you know, my various crypto nodes. Please let me just run Bitcoin infrastructure because I trust this stuff. I know how this stuff works. This isn't going to, you know, screw up my business or screw me over. Um, but I got to have the stable points. Right. So I think there will also be a, you know, a push from, companies who are saying, oh, please use the stable coins over on this platform, on this network, instead of these others, because these ones give us tons of problems. And and by the way, if, the, if you're paying five cents on the network, at least today, like you probably overpaid on the fee by mm-hmm. like a hundred X of what it actually costs. Just yeah, to kind of give people an idea of like how small, like we're talking like five sats, which, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, I mean, you're talking tenths of of pennies uh with the routing fees today um yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, it's not fair it's not a fair comparison no it's we, we are definitely 10x better yeah hey guys i just wanted to jump in here quickly and tell you about today's sponsor few investments make a better long-term hedge against inflation depression and economic downturns than precious metals like gold and silver and that is why i'm excited to tell you today about noble gold investments 
Noble Gold Investments is America's trusted provider of precious metals as they've secured over $1 billion in precious metals for their clients. They offer physical gold and silver coins, and they even let you invest in gold and silver through an IRA, allowing you to not only protect yourself against economic calamity, but also receive tax benefits as well. Noble Gold Investments is not just a company. It's your financial guardian for life. It stands for integrity, efficiency, and the American way. In this month, with any qualifying precious metals IRA, you'll receive a free 5-ounce solid silver America the Beautiful bullion coin. That's right, a free 5-ounce silver coin. Noble Gold Investments is here to help our listeners who want to invest in gold and silver. All you have to do is go to billionairesgold.com. That's billionairesgold.com to get this exclusive offer. Uh, yeah, if not more. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think there's this stigmatism inside of uh, the Bitcoin space for good reason um, that anything that is tokenized other than Bitcoin is just looked at as a scam or a fraud. And I think it, that if I was going to quantify why, it's just because um, when we look at anything beyond stable coin dollars or mm -hmm. stable euros, like it's just been a total rug pull. Totally. NFTs, all of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of people in the Bitcoin community, they, they would see the announcement and they're just saying, oh boy, now we're going to get rug pulled here. And then because of the scar tissue that so many people have with mm -hmm. everything that's happened in this space, or in particularly the last cycle, um, they're just... Uh, they just want to shoot everything that's not Bitcoin. I get it. Yeah, yeah. So what what mm -hmm. are what are some of your comments for that person as they're as they're hearing us have this conversation? What would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I think I would say, by no means do you have to use these assets, right? This is all purely opt in. Um, Bitcoin remains the only trustless asset, right? Um, it remains the most secure, the most decentralized, obviously the most supply capped. It's the only one that you can 100% verify your ownership of yourself. Um, this is by no means a substitute for Bitcoin. And we have taken great pains in our communication and in the design of the protocol to make sure that these assets only augment Bitcoin's existing capabilities, right? We took great pains to make sure that, you know, the way to transact on the Lightning Network is actually routing through the existing Bitcoin liquidity. Right. I think that's really important to note that, you know, this is not, this is, these are applications. These, these channels will plug in at the edges of the network and serve to like, you know, well, the, the image that I have in my head of this is if you have like, you know, a, this spider web network uh, of channels, right. All of a sudden you start pumping in, you know, additional energy, additional juice at the edge. And you just kind of see the spider web, like, you know, start vibrating and flexing and, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger like something from a you know horror movie or something like that i don't know if people follow me with that but it's really clear in my head i'll i'll do, I'll do some you know mid journey or chat gpt image generation to try and get you know get it out there um but this should only be something that exists to augment the existing lightning network to augment the you know node operators who just want to earn more bitcoin right um by routing these payments without having to upgrade and i think also we've taken great pains um in communicating that you know these with these assets you are trusting the issuer right you, you are trusting explicitly the issuer um this is not a you know trustless protocol the routing and using htlcs and using the same contracts that lightning network uses that is trustless Right. Um, that that still uses, you know, the same cryptography as as Bitcoin payments. Um, but if you're using a US dollar tappered asset, you know, you are trusting the issuer. And so for people who don't want to make those trust assumptions, then you don't have to use it. What we have seen on the counter, and I think this is, you know, important, is Bitcoin Twitter is very loud, but is not necessarily representative of all Bitcoin users. There's $120 billion of stable coins issued out there. Right. Um, there are, you know, I think the, the chart has been going around and we have this in the blog post. Stablecoin issuers own more U.S. treasuries than the country of Germany. 
right, than the country of South Korea. These are geopolitically and globally relevant um, on a scale that, you know, this is not just your little NFT pump and dump, right? Stablecoin, there is real persistent actual demand for these assets. And I think when we think about, you know, the ultimate um, goal of the Lightning Network, what we're shooting for is we're shooting to disrupt all of the analog payment networks, right? All of the payment networks that were set up and constructed before the internet. And this is, you know, SWIFT facilitates $150 trillion of transactions a year, right? Um, Visa and MasterCard, all the payment networks combined, you know, facilitate $40 trillion of transactions in a year, right? Mobile money networks, which are all walled gardens, that's another, you know, one and a half trillion dollars per year. Um, one thing that all of those networks have in common is that they support many currencies and not just Bitcoin. One thing that the Lightning Network does not have yet, but will have soon, is support for many currencies, right? And so I think when we think about, you know, making the Lightning Network feature complete and at feature parity as a system with these analog systems we're looking to disrupt, one of the most glaring missing things is support for, you know, primarily the dollar, right? With SWIFT, 46% of, with, of, of SWIFT transactions are the dollar, 23 is the euro, and then it's like, you know, EUR, JPY, RMB, downstream of that, right? So I think it's just one of those things where when we look at, when we look forwards, um, what do the next, again, like, just like we've heard from these lightning entrepreneurs, what does the next tier of user want? How do we keep growing this network? How do we get it to the point where it's, you know, reaches its destiny of disrupting all this legacy infrastructure? Like, well, we need stable ones. Um, this is kind of the next thing to add to it. Um, and I think, you know, again, like, I just want to underscore this. When I think about the Lightning Network from an infrastructure perspective, like, I think about it in the same breath as, you know, electrical power grids, as oil pipelines, right? As fiber networks, this is mission critical infrastructure or it will be mission critical infrastructure, right? For the world. Um, this is not just for, you know, although the micropayment use case is fantastic. This is not just for like tipping your friends and stuff like that. This is for global commerce. Um, and, you know, those numbers that I threw out earlier, right? You know, in the hundreds and tens of trillions of dollars a year, like yeah. that's, that's big boy stuff. Um, and that's where we're headed. When we look at this, this past cycle, I just can't even imagine the amount of monetary energy that was directed towards all these other science experiments mm -hmm. uh, happening mm -hmm. on all these other quote unquote blockchains. And I say that yep. because they're not actually decentralized. Um, and it, it almost seems like a lot of that on this next cycle is going to be pointed directly at Bitcoin for innovations like the one that, that we're talking about right now. hundred um, percent. Yeah. And I think that's really important. It's um, super important. And I think, I think that's, I mean, like for the folks that don't know my history, um, you know, I started my career in crypto. Um, I was the lead analyst at a crypto hedge fund, right? Um, I started, I cut my teeth in the industry, reading white papers about ICOs and stuff like that. And I, the, the whole two years, the longer I read these white papers, the more I talked to these founders and the more I educated myself about first Bitcoin and then second about lightning, the more mad I got that like, why aren't these people building this stuff on Bitcoin? Like none of this is going to matter. All of this is misdirected energy. That's just, you know, going into some black hole that's going to, you know, bump these tokens briefly and then send them down to zero. Like none of this stuff is going to matter if it's not anchored to the most secure blockchain, which is Bitcoin, right? If it's not taking advantage and leveraging the network effects of the 21 million cap, right? So this is like kind of personal for me in a way um, with when I got to Lightning Labs, you know, a big, big priority of mine was how do we get some of this capital from the, you know, crypto VC industry and just that's all of the capital that's flooding into these crypto projects, how do we re redirect that to Bitcoin? How do we get the energy and the attention back where it matters, where it should be, which is, you know, contributing to Bitcoin's network effects, contributing to Bitcoin's destiny as a global reserve currency, right? How do we, how do we get that back? And I, we've made amazing strides in that direction over the last four years, you know, and that's collectively as a community, you know, not taking any credit for that. We've made uh, amazing strides in the right direction. And I, I think you're exactly right. You know, there's never been a better time to build on Bitcoin. There's never been a better opportunity set for building on Bitcoin, 
right? There's never been more stuff to do. The tooling has never been better for developers. You know, not only are we talking about just Bitcoin or Lightning or tapered assets, we're talking about Noster, right? We're talking about, you know, Lightning and the, and the AI industry, uh, you know, micropayments there. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, there, there's just a, a host of new protocols and new opportunities. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite startups in the, in the tapered asset space already is combining the two interesting areas of Noster and tapered assets, right? And trying to kind of, you know, make something that's greater, uh, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? Which I think is really cool. So I think there's tons of tons and tons of space to experiment. And then, yes, our greatest hope is that in this next bull market, we won't lose so many people to the black hole of, you know, coins um, and, and all the associated nonsense. One of the things that I think is going to be important for the success of this is just on the wallet side. So mm -hmm. when we look at a lot of uh, Bitcoin wallets, they they are uh, in a lot of their branding. It's that we don't do anything other than Bitcoin for our wallet. What are they going to have to do in order to enable this so that if I want to receive a dollar, a stable coin dollar onto onto my wallet. Is it a heavy lift for them to enable a lot of this? Uh, the timeline for for their ability to implement something mm -hmm. like like that? What does that look like? Yeah, so we have, it's, it's never going to be, I mean, we've made it about as easy, I think, as we can. Um, if you're already leveraging, you know, our existing, again, that Litty bundle, um, and you're running either a mobile wallet or, you know, a custodial wallet or something like that, all you'll have to do is just upgrade to the latest version of the software and you will at least have on-chain support for these tapered assets. And, you know, um, that I think is going to be really important and really big to your point about wallet support because, you know, users aren't going to be touching the protocol directly. They're going to need some interface in between them and the protocol to make it easy. Um, on the timing front, like I said, like there is a very clear light at the end of the tunnel now um, predicting, you know, dates for um, software is something that now I've been doing this for long enough, I know to avoid that trap, um, you know, it'll get done when it gets done, but it is like absolutely our top priority. And, you know, we've gotten a, a pretty good track record of, of shipping code, um, you know, on time. Uh, and so I think that'll be, you know, something that happens sooner rather than later. Uh, and what you'll need to do as a wallet developer is basically you'll just all of a sudden inherit a bunch of new APIs that allows you to say, um, oh, I would like to open a channel, but not just a Bitcoin channel. I would like to open a channel that has, you know, some Bitcoin and also some tapered asset USD, right? Oh, I'm going to generate an invoice, but when I receive this payment, I don't just want to receive it in Bitcoin. I actually want to receive it in this other currency. Like, oh, I'm going to go send a payment. Um, and when I send it, I don't want to spend any of my Bitcoin. I want to spend my tapered asset USD, right? So there's going to be, you know, of course, a little bit of you know, there's an opportunity here, frankly, for the wallet who does the best, who abstracts it the best for the users. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see, but we have made it as easy as possible uh, in our minds. And now that we're ready for mainnet, like it's time to start getting feedback from the developer community and hearing, you know, what we did wrong and what we can improve. Um, so, you know, if, if folks are listening and interested in doing that, like the big ask here is run the software, um, let us know. Um, is it as easy as we think it is? Because that's just, you know, a classic thing with software engineering is, you know, you build according to what you think works and then you go and toss things over to the users and they say, oh, this doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. You know, you messed this up, et cetera, et cetera. And so we've done a really good job of engaging with the development community building up to this point, but, you know, um, always welcome more feedback. One of the things that, uh, has been frustrating. So, you know, I came out of traditional finance, looking at stocks and equity and all this, right, is being mm -hmm. the, the main thing that I would study and try to value and, and own. Um, when I look at all the crypto tokens and things that have happened in this space over the last, call it four to five years, well, the reason I was always just so disgusted by it all is because I would always say, so like, what? equity or what yeah. is this token like actually representing other than uh just marketing really i mean yeah. it's just like Bro, but this. like what if you could own a share of tcp ip yeah. you remember that <laughs> that was the, that was the narrative right Ugh. that was the narrative and so bad and 
it it got to the point where a lot of the tokens weren't even trying to convince people of a of a story yeah. of mm -hmm. technology that was over you know 99% of people's heads they weren't even trying to do that anymore it was just buy this picture of this monkey that has 20 different types of uh, sunglasses on that I used AI to enhance. And it, mm -hmm. there's literally no value or no equity behind any of this digital vaporware, right? Yep. Now, just in uh, July 15th, JP Morgan comes out and they are marketing this, the launch of the tokenized collateral network. The TCN is what they're calling it. And they're saying blockchain brings collateral mobility to traditional assets. They're going to tokenize equity. When I look at this, what they're, what they're effectively doing is they're making stock certificates immediately settling. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they already have the capacity to do this with, their, with the ledgers, their centralized ledgers that they already have. There's no, nothing new other than them basically using blockchain as a marketing scheme to do what they've they've already done. When I look at what you guys are doing with the Taproot Asset Protocol, I you can't get around the the SEC and every one of these developed nation states that uh, are working with these banks that handle these these equities mm -hmm. that that actually have things behind them mm -hmm. because of KYC requirements like if i have if i own a certificate of apple stock and i want to send it to you that certificate has to be kyc'd into your name and so i see i see a, a major disconnect with anything that gets tokenized beyond currencies like the dollar like what we've talked about which i see as the primary use case for this is is the tokenization of yep. currency right but tokenizing equities, I think, is going to be a whole lot more difficult. But I say all that in that in this conversation, I came to the realization that because JP Morgan's running this server, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're mm -hmm. running this blockchain server. There's an expense to this that mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like you can go out and run this uh, TCN node. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, like people aren't going to run out, go out there and run these nodes. There, it's completely centralized by J.P. Morgan. They have an incentive to leverage these rails because the cost to basically run the quote-unquote server or the settlement is is nothing. Mm -hmm. It's 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 completely been diminished down to to like tenths of a penny to settle these certificates as opposed to using their centralized uh, network. I'm just, how, where do you, and a lot of this, I'm sorry, there, there's, I guess, a question in here. It's me trying yeah, well, to- Yeah, well, so what I would say, around. I mean, a lot of this stuff, when I try and think about um, how things are going to play out in the future, although the analogy is never perfect, like, truly, I think you can look back at the lessons of the internet and how the internet spread. And I think you can learn a lot about how the internet of money is going to grow. Right. And so I would say what JP Morgan is doing is they have built a corporate intranet, right, of money. Right. And that's fine. Right. It, it may be good. There's some VP there that got a promotion because they're doing innovative things. Right. Um, but what happened to all the intranets? Right. All of them just got decimated because it was way, way more effective to leverage the network effects of the internet itself, right? All the open source software, um, being able to connect out to all of, you know, you get by connecting to the broader internet, you get the benefit of everybody else who's contributing to the internet, right? And I think that's the same thing, um, you know, with, with Bitcoin, with Lightning, with separate assets. Um, you know, another thing that I think in looking back at the, the internet, one more point before I move on to like specifically how would JP Morgan do this? Is like what the internet did more than anything else, like the, tr the trade um, of the 2000s was long Google, short print media, right? If you did that, you were a, ran out with a bandit, right? Because what it did was it was just more efficient to initially distribute instead of taking analog um, writing and publishing it as did in a digital format, it was much, much more efficient to take 
natively published, natively published, digitally published content and distribute that over the internet to everybody, right? That was just way better. And so you, you know, sadly saw all of these local newspapers and, you know, all of these different print media companies just get decimated by the internet, right? I think we'll see the same thing with Lightning, where, you know, the trade of the 2020s is long Bitcoin, long Lightning, short analog payment networks, right? Um, in the same way, because if you have, you know, physically analog issued currency and you're trying to move it or, you know, other assets, like you mentioned, and you're trying to then move it over digital rails, that's just so much less efficient than natively digitally issued um, currency that is distributed over these digital rails, right? And so I think the, the key here is that with currency, like what these, what Tether and these other com companies are doing is they have physical reserve, right? Or, you know, they're probably digital reserves, but the off-chain analog reserves um, that they have been issued as these digital units and they're just people love them, right? Because everybody around the world wants dollars um, and they just, they can't get enough of it. Um, and there are structural physical impediments to them getting dollars uh, outside of, you know, Bitcoin and Lightning um, soon or Tron at the moment. Um, I think, although I'm not a lawyer, what I would say with, um, you know, these other assets is I could see a similar model taking place where maybe there is some initial kind of private walled garden, one might say like a custodial side chain type thing that the issuer is running. Um, and for whatever reason, they allow, you know, their holders to take ownership of these instruments, which then they can transact over, you know, the internet of money, the lightning network, um, frictionlessly and, you know, at the, with the great speed benefits, uh, of lightning. And so I think, you know, ownership of this stuff is always really tricky. That's the devil is in that detail, the transaction of it. I think we have that solved. And I think like the, the gravity of the improved transaction experience, the lower fees, the instant settlement, the global reach, I think that will just continue to pull more and more assets into the digitally native world. Um, to your point, like currencies are very straightforward. That makes perfect sense. Um, you know, I think equities, debt, et cetera, a little bit fuzzier for sure. Um, but I think, you know, what we hope to do is to make, let it be known to smart people who see a better way of doing this, that we have a playground for you to come experiment, right? We have the tools. Um, we may not have it all figured out yet, but we would love to support, you know, what you're looking to build. Um, and help you build it out, you know, on a foundation and on a platform that's going to last um, and that is going to scale. It seems to me like if I had to guess how I see this kind of evolving is they're going to they're going to continue to come up with these these TCN networks between JP mm -hmm. Morgan and BlackRock mm -hmm. and whatever. And then what's going to eventually where I think the equity eventually gets tokenized is they will use these rails but they're going to use them for transactions between themselves, between BlackRock, JP Morgan, and anybody who's basically custodying equity on behalf of their KYC customers. They're going to use these types of rails, like this Taproot uh, mm -hmm. uh, network asset protocol, um, because the the cost for them to run it is nothing. It's it's mm -hmm. literally nothing. But then they can immediately settle with each other on these on these certificates because. One of the one of the issues that I've had is like the business model is the rehypothecation of these dang certificates, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. equity certificates. And as long as they have a stranglehold on that, because the SEC is always going to be behind their back and the equity has physical property in these in these in the United States or Europe or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the vulnerability of like why I think it's so hard to tokenize equity is because yeah. you have that physical contact point, right? Um, but I think that these, these entities call it JP Morgan or BlackRock because they rehypothecate the stock certificates so that they can collect a yield on, on lending them out. Um, I just don't see them with regulators giving up that stranglehold, mm -hmm. but I think that they would potentially lever this network because it reduces their cost to clear with each other. As well, so what I would, uh, I don't disagree with any of that, but one kind of thing I would want to shift your perspective on a little bit is, you know, like one thing we talk a lot about with, with lightning is like, look, the U S 
and Europe to a lesser extent is probably like the last place that um, lightning payments are going to take off on like a daily basis, mm-hmm. right? Because we have pretty good payments networks, right? Yeah. Like they, they generally work. I mean, I think, um, you know, they generally work pretty well. And there's not like a lot of pain that's forcing users to seek alternatives, right? We have seen great uptake of lightning in emerging markets where they don't necessarily have good payments experience, where maybe they are, you know, predominantly cash only, or they can't, you know, really, they can't trust the banks, not because, you know, they may be underwater on their bond portfolios, but like, because the banks like steal money from their accounts and stuff like that, or censor arbitrarily, right? So it's more like who has the pain point that is willing to take a risk on an early technology um, to build out first. And so one thing that I think would be really interesting is like, well, what if you look at places that don't have functioning securities markets, right? What if you look at places like, you know, Latin America generally, right? Where there isn't, you don't have the same ability to, you don't have the same capital markets um, as the US. um, And maybe you have net new incumbents or, or net new, you know, capitalists who want to create those markets, right? If you're going to create a brand new capital market from scratch today, Right? Are you going to go and talk to the New York Stock Exchange and like ask for their software and like a license? Probably not. I think it would be a lot easier to get started in your basement, um, you know, building with tabard assets. Um, and you know, that's again not a lawyer, not a regulator. I know it's a lot more complicated than that, but I do think that that might be an area where we see a lot more early development. And as it gets proven out in kind of these more nascent markets, you know, and the technology advances, um, that's when we start seeing some of the bigger, you know, Western incumbents who they don't have a problem with capital markets are looking to solve, right? It works great for them. Um, And I think, and the reason why I'm speaking confidently about this is this is exactly what we've seen with Lightning, right? Like, you know, this year we got Binance and Coinbase. Last year, you know, we got... um, you know, I forget exactly who, but like Cash App and, you know, a few others, right? Kraken um, was another big one we got last year, right? The year before that, we got Paxful and like, you know, big, important institutions that joined, but they were of the smaller variety, right? The way that these protocols grow is, you know, start from the ragtag crazy people who believe, right? Which is tempered assets today. Um, and we love them. And we are similarly crazy and believe. And then you get like a little bit bigger. Um, you get, you know, people who are willing to take not as much risk as the early people. They want to see the protocol mature a little bit, but they still want to be early. You know, the the early uh, adopters um, from the innovators, early adopters. And then you get kind of your early majority who just want a thing that works, um, but they are willing to take a risk. And then you try and cross the chasm. Uh, and so I think with Lightning, like this year, I think we have definitely successfully crossed the chasm. I've been writing a bunch about it in our newsletter and like a, a bunch last year about, is this the tipping point? Have we crossed the chasm? Is it really working? Like, I, I think we definitely have. And we're like well into, you know, expanding beyond um, into the early majority and beyond. And with Tappered Assets, I think we'll follow the same pathway, right? We're like right now it's the crazies, but, you know, who knows who will be the first person to figure out in their jurisdiction, like, oh man, like actually you know, we can raise capital for this business. We can tokenize the equity on chain and, you know, I can have a, you know, meat space legal contract with my local government that says these are valid securities. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, if you lose your private key, you know, tough, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, your, your shares are gone or something like that, or they're burned from the supply. Right. I think it's tough in the Western world and from a U.S. perspective to, especially if you have a lot of knowledge about how the current system works, to think about how it could be disrupted, right? Um, because you're like, well, all they haven't, you know, the regulators are all captured or whatever. There are no avenues for disruption. They have all their bases covered. Um, and I think that that's probably true, but there's a big wide world out there that, you know, may have problems they want to solve for themselves. I love that point. And I think you're exactly right. And I think what I was describing was a very uh, Western, uh, U.S. centric yeah, it's very mindset natural. as mm-hmm. I was looking at it. But I think as you look at, it, I mean, this is a massive opportunity for capital formation in areas that just haven't had the means to uh, 
to organize uh, equity and and build that that investor base out because of all the infrastructure, the inf the technology infrastructure that's required to do such a thing. And and boy, this really offers a a unique uh, change to that. Um, you, you know, what, one one thing that I would love yeah. to see my my like my favorite stories about like net new Bitcoin adoption are always about miners going out to you know rural areas and figuring out stranded energy sources, right? Like I don't yeah. know if you saw this, I'm sure you did, but like the the story of the guy who is running the national park in the Congo, I think it came out. It was like a year or so ago. I'll, I'll try and find it and send it to you to keep in the show notes to keep me honest. But it's basically, there's this guy who, you know, runs this national park, I think in the Congo. Um, and they have all of these rivers and all this hydropower. And they were like really struggling in COVID because nobody was coming to visit the park. And so he was like, you know what? Like we can monetize this energy. We can make some money. We just need some Bitcoin miners. So he did the work and figured out how to get some Bitcoin miners. And they all of a sudden, you know, started mining in 2020 when Bitcoin was, you know, at five or six K or something and, you know, made enough money to keep the park open and keep the employees and blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. Right. Like how cool would it be? Although that's an amazing story and great. And I hope people replicate it all around the world. Um, how cool would it be if there was a mechanism where instead of him having to front all the capital himself, right, he could you know, in his jurisdiction, say, look, I'm going to create some stock certificates on the blockchain, on tapered assets. Um, I'm going to sell them to the folks who want to, you know, front the capital and down the road, take an earnings, uh, take a cut of the earnings of the miners once they're live. Right. Um, and, you know, maybe even, you know, provide some shares to the local populace who is, you know, maintaining the mines or something like that. So he doesn't have to do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, directly. And, you know, I don't know if there's legal restraints or, or anything around that that would make that difficult, but how cool would it be if you could get capital formation out there to like actually solve a real problem of, you know, helping monetize some of this energy um, and helping to build out, most importantly, helping to build out real energy infrastructure in places that need it, right? I just think that would be awesome. I love that. I love that. If you're listening to this and you're, you know, you could make something like that happen, boy, wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be just wow. cool, right? Yeah. I would just love to see that happen. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned real briefly, and I just want to highlight another source for people about Lightning kind of passing over uh, its its event horizon, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, uh, River just recently published this incredible yeah. report uh, that laid out in tons of detail uh, why that that might be the case. We'll also have that in the show notes for people to look at. It's an awesome report. Um, Ryan, this is this has been a blast. I learned a ton. This is really exciting stuff that this is all happening on top of Bitcoin. No hard fork uh, <laughs> required for this. It's awesome. Out. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is just beyond taproot. I, I got to say taproot was required for this to, yep. to curb it. Yeah. Yep. Um, just really yeah. exciting time. And uh, we'll have links in the show notes for a lot of these sources. Is there any other, uh, anything else you want to highlight or bring to the uh, audience's attention? One thing that, you know, it's a bummer to end on this, but maybe for the folks that are still listening, you'll, I think you'll get a, a little glimpse into something special, which is we really strongly believe, and I think the River Report highlights this really well, that Lightning as a network has a really natural flywheel effect, right? When I say flywheel effect, I mean like growth compounds into growth and compounds into growth and compounds into growth. And like, I, again, I think I don't want to get overconfident or cocky and say like it's now self-sustaining and it's just going to keep growing till it's growing. But like the flywheel is starting to spin pretty fast. And when I say flywheel, what I mean is, um, you know, we start with developers developers come to this protocol, they build applications that abstract the details of the protocol for end users. Um, developers go and acquire users. Users transact on the network and create volume. Volume creates routing fees for node operators. When node operators start making money, that induces them to add more capital, right? To allocate more capital to the network, which improves the capacity for everybody. It also induces no node operators to join the network and start competing in the marketplace. The more node operators that there are joining, 
the network, the more developers there are tinkering, or tinkering with the software. And then the flywheel starts to spin and those developers build new applications, right? Those new applications bring new users. Those new users create new volume. That new volume creates more fees. That fees creates more liquidity and more nodes. And then we get more developers and we get more users, right? And so I think if you think about it in that framework, and we've been seeing this really start to spin over the last couple of years. And like, you know, again, when Binance joined the network this year, they probably, if Binance has 120, 150 million monthly active users, something like that, that's probably more than every application on the Lightning Network prior to them joining combined, right? I mean, Cash App was definitely the biggest previously with like 60 million. Um, so, you know, Binance and Coinbase joining, think about the energy that that gives to this flywheel as it spins, right? If collectively we got another 200 million potential users, think about how much more volume that's going to create, how much more trend, you know, transaction fees that's going to earn for these node operators, how many more businesses are going to join. Think about the network effects that are growing here, right? And then think about, okay, now what, we, what happens when we add dollars into the mix? And it's not just Bitcoin. Think about how many more users that's going to bring, how much more volume that's going to bring. Like this, this flywheel that's spinning, I think is, is really, really important for, you know, business people, for investors, for founders, for developers to understand, because, you know, if you had a chance to be early to the internet and start building an application and take advantage of just this massive exponential curve of growth that happened over the last 20 years, you know, you would want to take advantage of it. And I think we have a second chance here, right? I think, I think we have the internet of money, you know, in our grasp. And I think the fundamentals are so strong and the ecosystem is so good. And there's just never been a better time to get building on this network that like if you're sitting on the sidelines and you're looking for something to do and you've been interested in crypto generally, like I'm telling you, this is the opportunity. Uh, like it's happening, it's growing. And we're about to really hit an inflection point where we start to grow. I mean, it's been growing fast so far. I think we're about to start growing at a crazy speed. Especially with the Mac macro backdrop. I mean, it literally <laughs> could not be more perfect, <laughs> right? Just like across the board, the timing could not be better for building on Bitcoin right now. Yeah. Um, it really is just, I think, a special time and a special period. And so I encourage people to get involved because there's always work to be done and there's you know always new opportunities um, to be seized. I love it. What a pleasure. Uh, I learned a ton and uh, we'll have some of these articles in the show notes for people to pick through and really kind of uh, dive into. So uh, we'll have links to your uh, Twitter as well and Lightning Labs. And if people want to read whatever, it, we'll have it there for them. So Ryan, thanks for making time and coming on the show today. Have a blast. Thanks for having me. This is great. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. It intuitively makes sense why you know, when you send your cousin $100 of Bitcoin, you're not pegging that to the price a month ago. You're saying, okay, I'm going to send you $100. Here's $100. And that UTXO shows up on chain. And when thousands of people do that every single day in different USD denominations, it's kind of crazy that we haven't talked about this before.